history. Thanks so much for coming to this year's Raise Your Voice Symposium. So here's your reminder to take care of yourself, take breaks, grab snacks as needed. The next panel consists of three current gender and women's studies students, Caitlin, Phoenix, and Evie. Caitlin Maguna is a junior majoring in sociology and gender and women's studies with minors in social work and justice studies. Her plans after graduation are to continue her education by attending graduate school and starting a career in social work. Phoenix McClellan is a junior majoring in history and gender and women's studies and minoring in religious studies. After St. Mary's, Phoenix plans to attend graduate school to continue studies in history or gender and women's studies with the goal of eventually becoming a historian of sexuality. Evie Yarber is a junior with an English literature and humanistic studies major and a minor in gender and women's studies. She hopes to participate in the book publishing industry after graduating and exploring the various ways she can continue to raise voices through the power of words. Thank you.
which was the day that Brett Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford testified before the Senate. Twitter consistently generated a bulk of the conversation surrounding the topic of white feminism and discourses by other users who felt marginalized by the feminist movement. Sage Journal analyzed 146,124 social media posts across various platforms to see who exactly was posting and being included in this movement. There were over 65,000 posts on Twitter during this time period, and just about 50% of those tweets were from a black perspective. There were over 43,000 on Instagram, with only 27.4% being from a black voice. Reddit had over 21,000 posts, but only 3% were from a black perspective. And on YouTube, there were over 8,000 posts and about 18% posts. <coughs> Say Her Name was a movement created to call out police brutality against black women, which was launched in December of 2014. A large criticism of Me Too was that it positioned sexual violence as occurring through a singular identity lens gender, including the experiences of those who experience sexual violence. This movement is one that highlighted the stories of white women through the media, while saying her name was one created and used to advocate for black women. When you do a search of the hashtag MeToo on Instagram, the top result shows up as having over 3.2 million posts. Now if you do the same search for the hashtag say her name on Instagram, the number is far less only appearing in about 697,000. And it's important to note that Say Her Name became a hashtag years before Me Too was taken to social media. R. Kelly was a prominent figure in the music industry, and he engaged in the abuse of young black women for years without facing accountability for his actions. And his story is seemingly just another example of white feminism at work in a world filled with young women who were failed by the media. The allegations against him came three months before allegations against Harvey Weinstein, whose victims were mostly white women, emerged in the media. Weinstein was initially charged with a 23-year prison sentence with an additional 16 years for sexual assault charges, while R. Kelly was given a 30-year sentence. Cook County State's Attorney's Office decided to drop the sexual abuse and sexual assault indictments against Kelly since he was already facing decades in prison, adding only one year onto the sentence. And while Weinstein, because of his age, got enough years to land him practically a life sentence, prosecutors still felt it was worth it to continue to bring charges and add on years to his prison sentence. But Kelly, who would be eligible for release around his 70s, was not as important to, quote, waste resources on. Now looking towards the future, how does change happen? And what can white women specifically do to use their status to amplify the voices of black women? Those with a social media presence can use their platform to celebrate the achievements of black women. They can engage in hard to have conversations regarding race and their own white privilege, they can educate themselves on the experiences of black women and amplify the voices by simply sharing contact or just interacting with it. And within the workplace, white women have the opportunity to advocate for equal representation of black women in positions of power, challenge others and themselves on bias, and acknowledge that as white women, you have to battle sexism, which can make it difficult to do things like climb a corporate ladder, but black women have to add racism on top of those challenges.
religion, gender, and marital status influence how the legal system and media responds to sexually violent crimes against women, as analyzed through the intersexual lenses of Kimberly Crenshaw and Chandra Mahanti. Uh, I will mainly be focusing on Chandra Mahanti's feminist lens for this presentation, but Kimberly Crenshaw's theory of intersectionality also aided in my research. The main areas of Mahanti's feminist theory that help me research and analyze information that I found are Mahanti's terms of otherness and hegemony. Specifically, I look at how women of lower social statuses, who are also living in rural areas, are treated in the media and legal systems when compared to women in higher social statuses and urban settings like the city. Through Mahanti's term of hegemony, it becomes easy to, it becomes easy to see how common and normalized sexual violence and rape against women in India have become when analyzing statistics from, from the National Family Health Survey and the lack of urgency seen in police response and legal systems. to 
why she was placed in this category of otherness. A single was not an individual that people in power could identify with because she did not have access to, or she did not live in an urban setting, and she did not believe in the dominant, but she did not identify with the dominant religion. Therefore, leaving her, leaving her left out of media attention. Police investigation and legal justice. One of the sources that I use points out how women living in remote locations or consisting of lower class identification and resources, identification, identities, are less likely to have their cases of sexual violence heard because they do not affect the flow of urban life and therefore receive less attention and resources from the public. People outside these quote high profile statuses end quote, like the ones tied to GOP, rarely are given access to the police, let alone are able to gain any relief from their perpetrators being put behind bars. Because of this otherness assigned to them, still the public norms and ideas placed upon women's identities. Both of these cases are important, and this is not my intention to make it seem like one case is more important over the other, or that India has never gotten justice for women who have reported sexual violence against them. I am saying that it is representation matters for all women and individuals. I am saying that collective norms about certain women's identities need to be changed, and rather than solely hiding in cases or voices of other people that are sure to relate to. Some recommendations that I have for making changes in this area consist of raising awareness and resources for women and individuals living in India and uplifting survivors when they raise their voices. Another way to help is by increasing media attention uh, for women often overlooked by legal systems and searching for ways to improve India's governmental aid to survivors of violence. This could be as simple as providing areas of safety away from abusive relationships or training for people within legal systems to listen to women and their claims. Including more voices in the legal systems themselves would also be a step in the right direction. As in my recent research, I discovered uh, Karuna Nundi, who is a lawyer in the Supreme Court of India, who has been fighting to criminalize marital rape in India, but it remains difficult due to India's patriarchal legal system, seeing that even if a case is brought against the wife's husband, the courts are more willing to hear the husband out over the wife. Nundi actively works to petition the Delhi High Court, as she did in 2015 through 2017, and continues to do so in hopes of seeking justice for women across India and other countries that leave out marital rape. Research was on the sexual subjugation of women online. My thesis for this research was internet usage in recent years has allowed for harmful sexual expectations and stereotypes of women to become more widespread through increased exposure to pornography, celebrities, such influencers, and internet subcultures. The theory lens that I used for this research was Crenshaw's theory of intersectionality to help prevent the research from focusing on exclusively one type of woman, woman, as when you talk about violence against women, you should talk about all women. And Butler's theory of gender as this research was concerned with women's performances of femininity that are geared towards male gaze and performances which might be encouraged with violence. When I, the methods I used for collecting the data for this research was I analyzed news articles such as articles from The Guardian, HuffPost, and New York Times, as well as scholarly articles from JSTOR, Google Scholar, and Sage Journals. I also analyzed experiences of individuals, such as from the blog, the F word, which included fetishization of women loving women relationships. <coughs> Sorry about that. And for this research, I had three main focuses, as previously mentioned in my thesis slide. And those three issues were mainstream pornography, celebrities and influencers, and internet subcultures and communities. I focused on each topic for a variety of reasons. For mainstream pornography, I focused on I focused on it due to its normalization of the objectification of women, the fetishization of different types of identities, and brutalization of women. And while this somewhat plays into the previous point, Mainstream pornography also includes displays of heteronormative 
of the heteronormative male gaze, which has its own negative effects. For celebrities and influencers, I focus a lot on unrealistic beauty standards when I'm talking, when I'm talking about them, and that includes talking about the selling of different sorts of products, cosmetic and skincare, photo editing, and cosmetic surgery. We can get a bit of an idea of how celebrities play a role in setting unrealistic beauty standards from its image, in which a woman felt the need to attempt to have the sort of look that has been respond from individuals such as Kim Kardashian as she received cosmetic surgery as well as staff with her makeup in a similar way. For internet subcultures and communities, I focus on when talking about internet culture, you also have to talk about the different types of communities that make up a large portion of the internet. I used alpha males and incels as examples in my work when talking about this, as they have directly co contributed to online misogyny through things such as negative stereotyping of women and through encouraging violence against women. For example, the man in this image, Andrew Tate, was a large alpha male influencer who would brag about assaulting women in a number of ways and even encouraged other men to do the same. There is also a lot of heavy overlap in themes regarding female sexuality, behavior, and appearance. Overlapping themes lead to the creation of consistent sexual expectations and stereotypes slash myths about female sexuality and existence. Some of the stereotypes or some of the themes included hiding of blemishes, often rejection of perfectly natural things and perfectly natural bodies, such as people who are plus size or people who have bad acne. The selling of the idea of perfect bodies. Often the perfect body includes thinness and other things you'd see on the media such as large breasts or large behinds. Uh, and the idea of being sexually available to men always and the idea that women should act how men want them to as well as the normalization of violence such as women being hurt for men's pleasure, as well as the idea that men should use violence against women to make them submissive and put them in their place. I included a, I included a number of possible solutions, such as the use of comprehensive, comprehensive sex education that acknowledges, that acknowledges pornography usage um, and the idea that people are encountering pornography when they're younger and the idea that people are using it as a stand-in for reality and they are treating it as if it is real, accurate to reality, which is causing them to use it as an educational tool in learning how sex should happen. I also advocate for the creation of boundaries between online and offline spaces to help mitigate the effects of parasocial interactions with the goal of lowering the rate at which teen girls and women compare themselves to individuals who profit from it also helps slow or focus on slowing recruitment into radical communities as and re less radicalization equals less opportunities for extreme violence because when you're putting these boundaries in you aren't focusing on trying to be like these alpha male influencers who seem to have everything including muscle and money and most importantly I focus on the idea of creating space to talk about these issues as increased accessibility equals increased awareness. And by creating safe spaces for conversation, people will not only talk about these issues more, but also find finding about them to be more accessible. Um, increased accessibility means that it becomes easier for the general population to be made aware of the damage that is caused by a lack of education, but the effects of misrepresentation, misinformation, and marketing that constantly plagues the internet. I also was, I was also told that it would maybe be smart to include a portion on for future research. This research is the predecessor to my senior comp, and I hope to take it further by interviewing women in a tri-campus community to understand how these issues affect women in our own community.
open it up to questions. Um, <laughs> I will uh, call out people and then repeat the questions so everybody can hear. Go ahead, Liz. So these are all very different topics, very specific topics. I'm interested in hearing why each of you chose this topic as your research project. So Liz said um, she's interested um, in understanding why each of you chose your specific Well, I chose my topic because I'm pretty consistently on the internet, the same as my peers, and I'm constantly seeing these issues for myself as well as I've had my own issues caused by them. I chose mine. Um, I had known about the Me Too movement through social media, but I just learned in the last year of the true founder of the term, Tanara Burke, and I thought it was interesting that I had seen so much about this movement on social media but never heard about her, and just wanted to look into research surrounding her and what other voices were being excluded. I was just very interested in like a transnational perspective. I, I hear a lot about like what goes on in the United States, but rarely do I hear about what's happening outside of states, unless it's very biased. is um, I guess what's kind of the age demographic of um, maybe how early or how young um, children are being exposed to pornography. So in the actual research there's nothing with a range. I'd really like one but there was one study talking about how people's partners how they were being exposed to domestic violence as their partners had learned about sex from porn the relationships from porn and a lot of it referenced individuals who were encountering in their early teens. So that's really the age range that I have the most information on, but there was nothing about the exact like age ranges. Other questions? What was the difference between um, what you saw in the Indian media versus the Western media as you were doing your research? research, what is something that you would love to include or that you wish you could have included? I would love to look more into the legal side of like policy reform and legal reform as a response to the Me Too movement and to kind of look and see that if 
those changes help to shift the culture surrounding um, gender-based violence? topics, um, although interesting, are obviously very, can be really hard to like continue to read about, continue to research. Um, what did you three, and what do you continue to do to take care of yourselves when you're having to kind of be so deep into these topics? So the question was, given that these topics were maybe very heavy topics, what did you do or maybe continue to do to take care of yourself as you did this research?
I do think that's a good idea. I also think it would maybe be smart to maybe have events directly tied to how to avoid or handle situations with violence online. I don't think we have that. I think we have a lot of <coughs> stuff that's about handling like like violence, like if I were to like smack Caitlin. But like we don't have anything that really talks about like, oh well maybe this is a way to keep it down on your own profile or you know, like how to step away from certain things or block different hashtags or things like that. I think that's more so of a thing that would be helpful, more directly helpful at least. However, I do think unplugging events are good. And if you offer me a coloring page, I'm there. <laughs> reflect on boundaries between online and offline spaces, what would that be? I think part of it's the amount of sharing. Um, <laughs> as someone with online friends, like, I'm very prone to oversharing. I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have told them that. Mm -hmm. um, I have talked to this person for approximately a week, and I don't even know their first name. So um, I think that's a thing that's really normalized. But I've also seen that backfire on a lot of my friends to the point where they have been directly targeted and harassed by like groups of like 10 or 12 people because where we got the talks when we were younger but no one ever continued those talks when we were older and they were never given in the more serious light of this is how it looks as internet, the internet changes. important to stress like safety online. I think we talk a lot about like safety, like don't really like walk alone at night or do things like that physically, but I think that online safety is just as important for people of all ages. I also agree with that. I don't, I don't really know how to describe online versus offline boundaries. I am also a person who very much overshares <laughs> online because somehow it's a very curated safe space but also strangers at the same time and I feel like it would just be helpful if we did get more like an education about the online spaces a majority of us like grew up in the age of internet was popular and it was always like integrated into our lives and our learning but we never really like learned how to use it efficiently. <laughs> I'd also like to add that like, we're also a generation filled with really bad parasocial relationships where we think just because we know all these things about like celebrities and like influencers and just, you know, different content creators online, that we think that we're like friends with them or that we mean more to them than we actually do when that's not really the case. And I think that causes a lot of problems for a lot of people because they, they're like, oh, well, this person cares about me, and it's like, not necessarily. And I think that's one of the big things about it as well.
presenters mentioned that there has been an increase in um, violence or sexual assault in teenagers. So the question is, do you think that maybe any one of your research um, could have to do with that? For sure. Like, it's, with, I'm sure all three of us has been there where we've heard guys talk about like, oh, well, like, we saw this and like, we just thought like, we just thought all women like that. And it's something that's like, no, like you have to ask, like you, no one likes it if you just walk up and grab them by their neck and things like that. So I, I think it definitely does play into like the increased usage of like mainstream pornography and all of that. I don't know how much that connects to my research on the Me Too movement, but I'm currently doing research for my senior comp project next year on um, the correlation between like toxic and abusive relationships on television and what like girls are internalizing because of that. And I wonder if um, that comes maybe from media like Phoenix was talking about and also different television shows and what kind of is normalized in relationships on those shows. I feel like definitely like TV shows and media and the fact that like so many sexually violent things are very accessible online today. Like there's barely any restrictions and then you can like just get around those restrictions. And it's just so hard to regulate the internet when there's so many different ways that are like these violent images are accessible. And the fact that like it just gets spread. Like you find one thing and especially in high school it just gets spread around everyone and it's, it's so hard to stop. But I can definitely see how it specifically for Phoenix, what um, questions or what do you anticipate to see for your um, future research for your comp? So I don't have the questions figured out yet. I'm still working on that one. But I am fully preparing myself to hear something like just downright awful because that's honestly just the nature of it. Like with these topics, everyone's honestly probably got at least one war story, unfortunately. And so I'm 100% prepared for that. Um, or I think I am at least, we'll see. But I, I'm not quite sure a lot of it right now has to do with like what things each person sees, but it definitely will probably get a little bit more personal than that, just due to the nature of the topics. I actually had a question for the panelists as well. Um, given, again, kind of how Adriana mentioned um, that all of your research had to do somewhat with media, did you find that while you were doing research or after, um, your own personal media had more of the topics that you were searching for kind of pop up, like, I don't know, on your free page or, or something, because um, I know sometimes when I talk about random things, Facebook, the advertisement pops up and it's like, wow, you, you're listening to me. So did you all find anything like that? I personally didn't. I wish that I would have, but I didn't really have any change in any of my algorithms. Mm -hmm. okay. I would say that I might have felt like a pop up or two on like the Google and it's like request, not request, but like advertise different news stories or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think I probably got maybe one or two things and it just went away, which is actually pretty shocking. 
it really easy for echo chambers to form? And well, well, echo chambers are gonna form either way. Like it's really easy to go, okay, but I want all of my media and all of everything I do to be catered around like this specific thing, like, like this portrayal of women as like the submissive, sexually available, um, overly like promiscuous, like that stereotype. Um, because all it takes is for you to search it out as opposed to like in the real world, like you have to walk around and actually interact with people. And even though you can have like your own little group of friends, like you're not gonna be able to make the world, world cater to that in the same way. Thank you all for presenting.